Now we will have a very interesting talk by Maria Jose Molina Contreras <laughs> uh, about building a, an indoor air quality monitoring and predictive system. Welcome, Maria. Now? Yeah, awesome. Um, but before to start, I would like to know how many of you are you interested in do-it-yourself projects? Oh, 90% of the people. Nice. What about data science? Uh, a bit less, but yeah, awesome. Data analytics, sensors data. What about sensors? IoT. Okay, awesome. I think that we are going to cover all of these topics today, and I hope that you are going to enjoy uh, about that. Um, well, who I am. Uh, my name is Maria Jose. As, uh, as was mentioned before, I work, uh, I have a background in molecular biology. I work as a data scientist, and in my free time, I enjoy doing all these kind of projects, mixing uh, all the topics that I love in tech using Python. And this is one of those projects. Um, and how this a start, right? It's like how oh, one day I start asking myself or oh, wondering why should do that. With uh, the pandemic situation, my life, uh, well, the <laughs> everyone's life changed. But um, at the beginning, I was working in an office, going every day, having an active life. And then suddenly, I was working from home, no activity. And at some point, someday, I start to feel kind of very sleepy, really tired, headache. And I could not understand what was going on. At the beginning, I thought, well, the stress, the situation, um, meetings, uh, and these kind of things, until one day, I, in one of those moments, I opened my windows and I stayed there for 15 minutes just thinking of, I, life, I, and suddenly I started feeling better. And I, at the beginning I thought, ah, it was because I was complaining and relaxed and that. But no, I can tell you that was not that the reason because once another day happened again, I open again my window, and I start to feel better. And I start to think that something was not okay at my, at my apartment. And I start doing some research. I start looking in publications, in different resources, what could contribute to the air quality in indoors. And then I found a lot of resources and a lot of information that I start to analyze. One of them was the number of occupants at home. It's not the same if you are 10 people at home than two. And then this has some implications of how many, how many windows you need to open or how much time you need to keep your ventilation on or long, etc. Also, have control of humidity and moisture are really important because some organisms like fungus love this high humidity and moisture, and this also has an impact in our health. The way that the ventilation design, in other words, how many windows do you open and how you open your windows? Did you thought at some point or at, at some moment, how do you open your windows at home? I just recommend that uh, you start thinking about that, or maybe I will motivate to you to do it after this talk. Also, the pollutant sources is not the same live in a small city than in a big city or close to a factory. It's not the same live close to volcanoes that are in a desert. And also, there are others or gases, right? Well, after all that, they say, oh, well, awesome, but I need to focus a bit because there are a long list of things that I can check and I can not manage that. Um, I went to the bibliography, the publications, and see that there was people working in, in CO, the analysis of CO2 and indoors and see how this could affect our 
uh, our uh, health and our concentration. And I thought, hmm, wait, maybe this was my issue. Let's go for that. And if you take a look, just a curiosity, the first, uh, the first publication is indicating that maybe, it's suggesting that maybe uh, the levels of CO2 could has an implication of decision-making performance. This means that if you need to have an important meeting, open first your windows because maybe this could have a better outcome for you. Well, what is uh, about the CO2 ranges and health? I just wanted to share, uh, to give you an overview what, uh, when we talk about air quality, what means. Uh, in the I-axis, we have the CO2 part per million, and then we have the, diff the curve with the different um, evaluations of things that we can see. The thing is, under 1,000 parts per million, everything is okay. The quality of uh, your, it's considered the indoor, it's in a good, um, in a good uh, condition. After that, it's uh, starting to have not, it's considered not healthy. Of course, this is gonna depend on other factors, uh, um, depends also if you have previous, uh, previous conditions and long, etc. because, well, you know that uh, it's not what I'm like, it's a more complex thing. Um, and then I decided to start my project. We are gonna go a step by a step. You are gonna see how I build it, how, how I managed to put it all together and what I got at the end. The main uh, structure is uh, I had some sensors, I was collecting data, and then built a monitoring system. With the monitoring system, what I was having is a track of the values. But um, even if it is really nice, I would love to know in advance when I need to open my window because uh, I want to have a healthy environment before to go to the meeting, for instance. For that reason, I thought that build a predictive system could solve or help to solve this thing. Well, let's start with sensors and how I collect the data. Um, I use uh, two sensors, really. On the, on the right, here we have the CO2 sensor. And then on the left, we have the air pollutant. Um, even I mentioned that I was more focused in, two, in CO2, I wanted to have the system with both, uh, with both uh, sensors to take as much data as possible to later make the decisions based on what I could see in the data. In, this, in the air pollutant, what we are uh, quantify, collecting is data for particles. As, as smaller is the particles, more uh, more probability to have damage in our lungs, for instance, just to give um, an idea why it's that. Well, you're gonna see that this project was not done by once. It's not only uh, that you arrive and build it and everything is super okay. It's a real project. Then I did try, I kind of fail. Now that we're in confidence, I can tell you that I failed for some things, um, but I learned a lot in the process. And this is what I want to share with you. One of the projects that I decided to implement as first was uh, using this sensor of particles with a QT Pi uh, microcontroller because it was really small and this would allow me to have a lot of mobility, let's say in that way. I run it with Circuit Python, if you're not familiar with. It's a fork of MicroPython, it's a version of a simplified py Python. The, the challenge of this system, of this approach, is that I wanted to collect the data because I wanted to use the data. And with this microcontroller, I could not uh, do it. In parallel, what I was doing is using the CO2 sensor with a ESP32 uh, 
microcontroller using MicroPython. Uh, was working uh, was working really good. The challenge that they had with this system is that then once I, it, it was working, I decided to have 20 features more because uh, I am the worst stakeholder of myself. I decided that I wanted to have a screen that, that, that has a interactivity and then and uh, long, etc. And I had to move on to another approach. Then I jump into Raspberry Pi, in that case um, with uh, wireless, and I connect the two uh, sensors to the to the Raspberry Pi. And as I mentioned, I wanted also to have this interactivity for the dashboard because I wanted to have the dashboard, but in my uh, in my desk close to me, and also I wanted to have it uh, kind of total. For that reason, I use a Raspberry Pi 4. And maybe someone is wondering, yeah, but this could be simplify or this version or another way. Yeah, it's true. But I had uh, at home the Raspberry Pi 4, and I thought, ah, oh, why don't use it? Let's do it for that. And that was uh, the, comp the, the full uh, system. Then, uh, what we had the, in the system was uh, to the two sensors where we were collecting the data. We have um, the connection for the two Raspberry Pis, and then we had this monitoring uh, system in the Raspberry Pi 4 that we are going to see a bit later. But let's go to see how the data was looking for, right? Um, in here, uh, what we have is CO2, humidity, and temperatures in temperature in, in Celsius degree. And you can see some oscillations. Uh, what is um, completely normal because you open the door, now is uh, is winter, then is summer, what? These kind of things. But what is interesting and is uh, something that you are gonna, we are going to see later is that we have some peaks around this value that it's very high. It's, if you remember the first plot, I was telling you that the good uh, air indoor quality, um, it was our, around 1,000. You are, you are going to see that something was not super OK. Then what I did is analyze. Uh, how many times I was having those values. In the um, x-axis, we have the CO2 ppm with three different phases and colors. Um, and in the y-axis, the frequency. Green means that uh, it's considered OK. The, the orange is like meh. And in purple is, uh, no, this is not going OK. Especially the ones that we have uh, here an arrow. Uh, at some point uh, of, all of this time, I was close to almost 2,000 uh, um, per, per million of CO2, and this is very high. What bring me to the, the point to say, wow, it's really important to have uh, control and monitoring of these values. Then, on the other side, we have the predictive system um, to kind of take in advance uh, decisions uh, before uh, this arrive. Um, in this case, this one, if you're not familiar with, is um, a more a time series forecasting. Uh, what we have, this is another example, just to let you show you how it works. In the x-axis, we have the time. In the y-axis, we have uh, the, um, the census value. And in here, as you can see, something in time happened. And this is what I wanted to see in my system. Well, this is my plot. <laughs> Sorry for that. I just wanted to show you a, in a big drama situation. And just to point you a couple of things, because uh, I think that this plot, of course, um, it's not the best plot ever, but it uh, has really interesting things that we can kind of mention, right? In the x-axis, we have the index. In this, in the, in, this means that we have the time, uh, but we convert it to an index. But this is how we manage the time series. But 
let's say that index is related to time, and y-axis we have the CO2 change. Well, let's just start with the first arrow. Can you, can you imagine what happened in the first arrow? Any idea why I have this oscillation and suddenly drop out, decrease so dramatically? Yes, I was not at home. <laughs> I was not at home, uh, what the, which is really nice because I realized that the system was working okay. It was like, oh, okay, if I am not at home, I have that. Uh, yes, that was that. And what about the second arrow? Because the second arrow, the, we have a decrease, but uh, you know, the, not at the same level. Any other idea? <laughs> really good uh, answer, but no. The thing is that I changed the way that I was opening the windows. I changed, uh, I uh, start playing to open the windows uh, in a different way, in a way that I could change the flux of air uh, and the ventilation was different at home. And this has a, an impact of, uh, uh, on time. And then I forgot it, as you can see. I continue doing it randomly. <laughs> and uh, of course in here we have a, a huge peak that came because there I had visit at home. And then as more people you have at home, more the CO2 level is higher. Then you need to kind of change the habit of how uh, you are um, opening the windows. And what about this decrease? You can see uh, this, the tendency is decreasing on time. Some idea? Yes, uh, summer arrive and I open the window more frequently because I live in Germany, it's very cool and you know, so it's like, oh, okay, it's open, yeah, it's closed. Uh, but then the good weather arrived and then it was like, oh yeah, now. Yes, this has an, an important role. Well, then for the predictive system, after analyze all the data, uh, learn from my own mistakes or how I was opening and closing the window, I start doing research of how implement the, the predictive system, right? And there are a lot of ways and there are a lot of uh, solutions. Uh, in that case, I also went again to the bibliography and I found this uh, really interesting uh, publication that was collecting different approaches. And I decided to implement one of those. In this case, it was this one, because I was having sensor of, uh, I was having the data from temperature, humidity, or, and CO2. But to be honest, I did my own version of that. Because at the end, what we need is doing work for, for us. And what I monitor and I collect this was the, the CO2, the humidity, the temperature, the particle, but also the activity level, because my sensors were located in my office, because it's where I, I need to have this information, this tracking. Then let's go uh, very focused, because uh, if not, we are not gonna have time. But uh, the, one of the most important thing is that I create uh, our windows a window system where I had a period of time and then I predict in one hour. And then have this moving window and prediction once and once and once. I use uh, CNN. Um, I'm not sure if you are familiar with this kind of architecture. We are not gonna have time to go deep on that. But uh, just to show you uh, just an schema how looks like this, uh, this, uh, this architecture. Uh, in here, I usually love uh, to see that in the presentations. For that reason, I add it. But uh, if you are not familiar with uh, neural networks or you don't work in data science, no worries. I just try to also summarize different information here. But the most important is that to, to, to know that, well, um, I was using a convolutional 1D where I was uh, analyzing and extracting the features 
uh, along the time. I have these window size that I was mentioning you, and also I was uh, adding these features that was uh, temperature, humidity, CO2. And then I predict the CO2 value in one hour uh, on time. Let's go just really briefly. Um, for me, the metrics was more focused on road mean square error to performance. And for hyperparameters, it's tricky, uh, let's be honest. And as a, it's a data science project, it needed, needs to be iterated. For performance perspective, um, the windows, uh, I pick some random days and then I predict the values. Uh, but the, how good it is depends a lot about the window. Just to show, show you as a result, what we have is in here we have three products that is, uh, are normalized. In green, we have the labels. And uh, in um, orange, we have the predictions that are, are these. And as you can see, at some points, the predictions are quite good. And at some points, are not super accurate. And even at some point, we have some drift. Uh, on time and um, yeah then let's uh, let's uh, let's start to finish in here uh, I didn't mention before that for displaying the monitoring system I use a flask application very simple you're gonna see and let's see who looks everything together well um, this is a longer story, but I didn't, I didn't know how to manage the sensors and the things in a really aesthetic way. And I have this frame with a picture with my, of my sister. And, and I thought, OK, why, why don't put the sensors there? Uh, yeah, and I removed my sister's picture. Don't tell her. Don't, sh don't share this information with her. Uh, but yeah, but uh, it's really easy to handle and also it's uh, kind of more aesthetic if, in case that you don't want to have everything uh, there. Um, but yeah, this whole looks the Flask application in the Raspberry Pi 4 and you can kind of interact with it. Uh, it's very simple, of course, uh, and also you can do it. Um, and here is a very short um, demo that you can see that change the prediction and when change the prediction also change the color. What is work in progress? Um, I want to implement the same system but using microcontrollers. That was my, my, first, uh, um, my first idea. I, I am doing this version using TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. Um, I could not integrate the particles information in the model. Uh, this is a longer story, but it's something that uh, uh, I think that I needed or I am interested. And of course, needs optimization. This is not the final version that uh, I can deploy tomorrow. Well, for home, yes, but not for other things. Um, and yeah, I just, if you want to be in touch or want to be more, I will be happy to share more info. And, and at some point, I'm going to also share all the code in the GitHub that, and also you can also implement your system with, uh, as I did it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maria Jose. Uh, we have several questions, so let's get into them. The first one, what is the approximate budget for a project like this? I was looking into CO2 sensors and they are not exactly among the cheapest. Yes, the most expensive, I think that is the CO2 sensor. Um, let me remember, I think, but it's not super expensive, but uh, I can share later on then the specific uh, price, but it was around 40 euros. Um, yeah, but uh, if you compare with other sensors, like moisture sensors that you can take, it, you can have them for very low 
price 40 uh, start to be high. But I can give you more info later on. I will hmm? be happy. Is the concentration of CO2 the same in all places in the room? Do you have some fan to make the air mix and change around the sensor? Oh, really good question. Uh, honestly, I, uh, I have uh, all my sensors only in one room, and I didn't move my sensors around home. This, and I don't have um, a, a ventila an active ventilation system. What means that I only know uh, how is the air quality in my office, to be fair with you. Sounds like an experiment for PyCon 2023. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you recommend for people who want to start with microcontrollers, MicroPython or CircuitPython? This is a really good question. And it's, um, I have several discussions about that. The, I, I think that the, both of them have uh, pros and cons as, as everything in life. For instance, um, circuit Python, one of the things is as uh, other fruit is uh, behind um, this fork, they have a lot of um, tutorials, beginner friendly. And then it's really easy to start because you can follow a tutorial, you know which cable you can connect, and then pro can provide you more easy start point. But at the end, I think that depends because, for instance, in here in this conference, there is a workshop about MicroPython. What I was super excited and a bit sad because I could not be there <laughs> because I was in my talk. But it's, uh, I think that depends. I am, I'm pretty sure that if you go uh, to, to this workshop, you can uh, start really easy program microcontrollers with MicroPython without any problem at all. Did you try to measure and mitigate factors other than CO2 in your room, such as humidity or other pollutants? Um, yeah, uh, there was included uh, in the system the humidity and the CO2. The, the humidity and the temperature were uh, in, the si in the system too. The thing is that what was not uh, considered was the pollutants. Um, uh, but yeah, it's a future work. How much time did it take, take you to put it all together? And maybe I'll extend that a little bit. Uh, now with all the knowledge that you have now, yeah. how long would it take for someone else to, to start from scratch? <laughs> this is a really good question. Uh, I think that it uh, depends because it um, depends how it's your uh, knowledge of uh, Raspberry Pi, for instance, right? Uh, if you are new on that or if you are not uh, confident programming or depends. Uh, right now, if, you, if I had everything at home and let's consider that you know everything, <sighs> For setting up the, the microcontroller sensor and that it could be a weekend project. The thing is that uh, for the data science part is more, it's longer and more uh, time consuming because you are gonna need to check your data, check that everything goes okay, and then decide which is the, the best machine learning approach because I show you a neural network, a deep learning approach, but maybe you don't need to go that. Maybe in your system you can use just uh, for time series forecasting machine learning or other approaches because I saw that other people were in, in, uh, developing other uh, solutions. Uh, for the, the data science uh, part, you need a bit more time. Uh, now that you, you have gone through the trouble of putting it all together, your data and your code, is it available somewhere? Are you planning to publish that? Sorry? The data and the code that you, you have written, uh, data you have collected and code you have written, are you planning to publish that somewhere or is it already Yeah, available? I'm gonna share it in GitHub. But it's a, I need to organize it a bit. <laughs> Let's be honest. <laughs> I need to organize uh, the project a bit before sharing, but uh, my idea is, uh, yes, uh, have it open and then people can 
go there, use it, and improve it. Because uh, I, we need to improve the system, and maybe people can even contribute to, to improve the system. Very nice. So we look for your name on GitHub and, and, yes. and look for the repository. Excellent. For predictive purposes, how much do you think that placing a sensor on the outside would help? I mean, as a small in and outdoor network of sensors. Um, the thing uh, with the outdoors, um, for instance, the sensor that I show you, it's uh, for indoors. Uh, because at the beginning I thought, oh, maybe I can go put it indoor, outdoor and play with that. And this is specifically is for indoors. Then um, I don't have, a, to be honest, I don't have a lot of knowledge about uh, versions or um, models of a sensor for outdoors. Uh, but I can point to, to you some uh, manufacturers that are working on and the, the expertise. The, yeah. Another one is not, not a question, but a comment. There are IKEA sensors, and they can talk to the C report. Um, awesome. What tools uh, do you use for interpolation of missing data, such as when there is a communication error? Oh, really good. Uh, well, I directly use my, my own knowledge in data science. And the good thing is that I, w I didn't have uh, a lot of uh, errors or no values or mm, discalibrations. Then I didn't have to, uh, to do so much, but uh, what I did is just uh, take a look to the data, analyze it, and make decisions based on that. And yeah, but we can discuss later if someone has this issue, what uh, specifically approaches you can use it. And you already commented that you did not move around to sensor, but can you move, move the CO2 sensor around to different rooms? Or is it better to keep it in one place close to you? So it's kind of like, you know, what do you, what do you think? You can do it. You can move it. Um, the thing is that uh, this sensor, um, if you are going to move it, I recommend that you, uh, once you take the, the values of the CO2, take it in some distance that you have enough time to go from one room to another. Because once you move the sensor, what is happening is that you are affecting to the measurement. Uh, then it's not, I think that uh, this kind of sensor is uh, it's designed to have it more fixed, probably to have more than one at home or wherever you have it, and then collect this data pull it, manage this data from the different devices. I think that the best is that. The thing is that for this project, I wanted to have it only in one location. Also, to be honest, also price-related topic, because as more sensors that you have, more expensive, and also my apartment is really small. And then it's quite easy to have kind of control of the environment. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Maria Cosa. Thank you. Okay, and as Petar Dolak prepares for, for his talk, which is going to, uh, to follow now, uh, one announcement to make, there is a sign-up sheet for the Lightning Talks. How many of you went to the Lightning Talks yesterday? Out of those who went, keep your hand up. Out of those who went, how many of you loved them? Oh my goodness, even more hands up. <laughs> uh, so it looks like they were quite popular and they're a very popular part of, uh, part of PyCons. So if you would like to give your own lighting talk, as you saw yesterday, it could be anything. It could be making music, it could be how do you properly tie, uh, uh, how do you, how do you uh, uh, wind up the, uh, the, the cables, or it could be anything, really. So um, you, can, you can sign up. Uh, the sign-up sheet is outside uh, of, the, of the Titans room. And um, yeah, that's something that, that might be worth checking out. Number two, as you saw here, uh, this was a start of a discussion, so uh, you, can, you can go ahead and, uh, and hack on this project. Now we have some basic ideas how to start with, uh, with measuring indoor air, air quality. There are questions about adding an outside sensor. There are questions about moving, moving the sensor around. There are questions about uh, adding other sensors for humidity and, uh, and, and other pollutants. So this could be absolutely worth checking out. So 
Uh, this is a great place to get started. You can, you can talk to, uh, to the speakers, you can talk to each other, brainstorm about ideas, and, um, and keep improving on what, what has been discussed here. Mikrobit je programovateľný milý počítač, ktorý ti dovolí prepojiť informatiku s kreativitou. Dá sa programovať veľmi jednoducho a ovládať tak, aby robil presne to, čo chceš. O pár minút sme zvládli rozsvietiť vlastný obrázok na displeji a o chvíľu sme už obrázky diálkovo prepínali druhým mikrobitom. Mikrobit má v sebe aj super vychytávky, ako sú tlačidlá, senzor pohybu, kompas a teplomé. K mikrobitu ale môžeš pripojiť množstvo ďalších vecí. Tu programujeme, aká animácia sa nám má ukázať na LED pásiku. Ja som na ňom naprogramovala dúhu. Teraz programujeme podľa nôd kohútika Jarabého. Najlepšie na mikrobite je, že si viem vytvoriť napríklad blikajúceho robota alebo gitaru, ktorú ovládať tak, že ňou zatraciem, alebo futbalovú bránku, kde mi mikrobit počíta, koľko gólov som dala, alebo kúlové svietiace topánky a tisíc ďalších vecí, ktoré ešte len vymyslím. Mikrobit je hračka, ktorú schováš do dlane a vytvoríš z nej čokoľvek. Tak čo s ňou spravíš ty? Každých 60 sekúnd si 28 tisíc ľudí predplatí službu Netflix. Odošle sa 197 miliónov e-mailov, stiahne sa 414 tisíc aplikácií a ukradne niekoľko tisíc hesiel. Na internete sa toho deje veľa. A všetko najdôležitejšie sa dozviete na Živé SK. Živé SK. Technológie ľudskou rečou.